particular, I had to bring that to the forefront um, for everyone. And so I had the opportunity to testify before Congress on mm -hmm. behalf of families for the Family Act, you know? And so advocacy, although it started with Head Start, it rolled into other areas in my life and community. So this run for school board was just that next natural step mm -hmm. to make sure that we had strong representation from the community on behalf of families on the board. Right, right. <laughs> So, so my question, it, you go ahead, you go okay. ahead, Shamar. I was going to say, so, you know, you, you made a valid point in regards to, you know, un, you're, you are the expert in understanding your child, right? And a lot of times when you approach teachers and you try to say, hey, this is kind of how my child learns or this is their learning style, that you typically get that pushback and say, well, we don't have the time to just spend with your child because we have a whole classroom mm -hmm. to teach, you know, and so... How do you get across to those types of teachers that are not willing to go the extra mile or take the extra initiative step to really make sure that every child in their classroom is successful in order to move forward with um, with you know their life and being able to achieve things? Right, for sure. And we know that classroom settings, um, you know, that's another thing I'm fighting for. Our classrooms are so overcrowded at some schools. And so, you know, teachers... Teachers don't often have um, the, I won't say the time and support that they need to be able to differentiate learning for each student. But I do encourage parents to just keep at it, right? Um, I always said that, well, I've always heard that the squeaky wheel gets the oil, right? <laughs> so you have to keep advocating for your child and what you know their needs are. But I also, um, I also work with parents to make sure that not only advocating on that classroom level, mm -hmm. building a relationship with the teacher, but mm -hmm. building a relationship with the entire school. Right. Learning, learning when is next, you know, time to step it up to the next level because you've, you've done all you can at the classroom level. Maybe I need to talk to a counselor um, to get my child's needs met. And so... But don't you become, because I mean, you know, I've had, and I took, you know, Rose already, I've had some experience here, challenges here specifically, uh, moving from Texas to now having my kids mm. here in Vegas. It's a very different type of dynamic in regards to how they teach in Texas versus here and the level of support that, you know, it's exactly what you mentioned. And so I've had challenges mm -hmm. Um, with teachers here as well, where I'm involved and I want to talk to every counselor and I want to talk to every teacher and I want to be, I want to talk to the principal, right? And I get the sense from them is that, oh, here she comes again. <laughs> here she comes again. <laughs> and so, and, and, you know, and that kind of makes you as a parent feel like, hey, are, am I step overstepping mm -hmm. boundaries? Is it that I truly care about my child and I want them to have that same level of care for right. my child because they're there, what, eight hours of the day or so. Mm -hmm. yeah. is for them to be able to feel, you know, wanted in that environment and cared for, you know, because I'm leaving them in their care. So how do you combat those types of personas or, um, you know, how they may think of you when you are coming to them in that kind of manner? Right. Well, we've been there and I admire your passion, right? I call it I call it passion. Right. <laughs> it is. It's like, oh, I admire your passion. But it I mean, seriously, you are you are trusting them with your most precious gift. You know what I'm saying? That's your right, child. Right. That's your child. And it's important that they know, you know. I don't want to be a problem when I come, you know, I'm not coming to be a problem. I'm coming to establish a relationship. This is a partnership that we have, you know, for now, like in school for the next nine months, we, we are married. We're in a committed relationship <laughs> for this child, you know? <laughs> and so please know that I'm coming. Um, but if you come respectfully, right? Right. Of course. At, the, at the end of the day, it's all about respect in order to build those relationships with um, the teachers and administration. Um, you don't always have to come on 10. You know what right. I mean? <laughs> but I mean, it's important that 
you know, and they should know if you're coming constantly that you are committed to your child getting the you know, the best education and having the best experience possible. Right. There, there is nothing wrong with that and don't ever feel bad about it. And, you know, eventually, you know, they know, they, they absolutely know that it's, that it's about not only your child, but the other children. You're there, to, you're there to support the educators as well. So, you know, when you volunteer in the classroom or at the school, Right, right. You know, it's a true partnership. You want to make sure that all children are safe. You want to make sure that all children have access to the resources that they need. Mm -hmm. And you can also become an ally for the schools, right? Right. You can advocate yeah. for the things that you see that the school need. Look, right. I know you need additional support. I'm willing to go to the school board on your behalf. You know, that, you know, so sometimes we have to. Sometimes we have to flip it. Like we are in a partnership and I'm here for you and with you. So I think we have Jay back. Are you back, Jay? I am. <laughs> Yay. Okay. So for everybody, you probably you can't see her, but she's really here. Okay. So I'm I'm, I'm glad you were back because we did want to get into a little bit also about. Jay and um, and everything that Jay's doing for our community. Um, so I'll let you go ahead with that, Shamara. Yeah. So um, I know that we I, I already did my intro with you, you know who you are and what you you're doing. So I want to give you an opportunity to uh, take the floor and tell everyone about yourself. Um, as you can see, Rose did put your website up there. So there's a lot of things that you're doing in the community, and we want to hear all about it. So go for it. Awesome. Thank you so much for the opportunity. So my three main focuses in Clark County School District when I win this race is student safety, student access, and equity and inclusion. Uh, a lot of work has been done over the last year as I co-founded 1865 No Racism in Schools. I've been working in collaboration with the school district to ensure that we have inclusive and safe learning environments by bridging the gaps in uh, inequalities that exist within the within the district among our among our students, and a lot of people, you know, are aware uh, here locally that it started because my son was one of nine students who was targeted in a hate crime uh, where it was a threatened school shooting at a high school to kill all African American students, and at that very moment, I knew that there was something more to being a parent than just sitting back and taking a position and allowing people to tell us what it was. I then began alongside uh, the other co-founder, Akiko, to actually begin my race for change. So we have over the last year created a parent patrol where we have parents that are involved. It is our way to stay connected to the community and to be able to serve as advocates for the parents. As we connect to them, we are able to be better servant leaders when speaking with individuals at the district level. Um, we have implemented the uh, crisis response model for hate motivated behavior inside of CCSD uh, they, that is now adopted as a part of their emergency response protocol. And we are in the accountability phase, which includes training um, for uh, equity, diversity and inclusion of staff. So uh, student access is a big deal. Tamika and I are actually uh, very close um, candidates. We, we're both running in two different races. However, we have addressed the disparities in access and access is a real issue in our district. Um, whether it's access to food and feeding sites or access to digital technology and internet uh, access to complete the homeschooling and the list goes on, technical programs and kindergarten and, and all of the things that people don't really think about. Yeah. And so as I take my journey as a parent, I intend to run my race 
as a parent uh, connected to the community who hears the heart of the community and hears the heart of the teachers. Mm -hmm. And I use my voice as an advocate on that panel with the fellow trustees to make decisions. I'd say for the, this is a question for the both of you. What do you find being that you both obviously have children and families, you both have volunteered time in the community, um, you know, starting off when your children were very small, that you find that is the most needed? Because sometimes people just run for office but have never really volunteered and worked in the community. You know what I'm saying? Um, and they haven't had that that relationship as raising a family and having having to be involved, not really having mm -hmm. a choice, that you found that there's something missing that where you can kind of fit in the gaps, fill in the gaps. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. There are, this is Tamika, for me, there are so many areas because this is a lived experience, right? This is a lived experience. And even um, serving on the board with Head Start, and also working at the community garden, I've had the opportunity to volunteer um, with different food banks. Um, food insecurity is real. Um, I've been in classrooms where I've witnessed children put food in their pockets to take home to their younger siblings or right. to have food on the weekend. Mm -hmm. This is real and this is America in 2020. And this pandemic really, um, things that I already knew existed, Jay already knew existed, um, was really brought to the forefront when this pandemic happened and schools had to close down immediately, right? There, was, there were children who depend on those two meals at school throughout the day because their families budget for that one meal to make sure that they feed, you know, have dinner on the table. Right, and right. So, we know and we're thankful that the school district had food available, but immediately when it first started, it wasn't in the areas that truly needed it. It was so hard for those families to get to it because it was placed at schools that were outside of their area. Many families didn't have transportation um, and even carpooling was almost not even an option because at first they wanted families, they wanted the children to be present to get the food. Uh, and it was like, how, <laughs> how are we going to do this? You know, families are having to pay for, but pay for the bus to get their kids to a food site in this pandemic where we're supposed to be social distancing, like it just mm -hmm. didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's when we initiated the stuff a bus program. Like, can we bring the food to the children, please? <laughs> right, Jay? Right. Bring the food to the children, please. Also, yes. with the technology divide, it was, you know, it was crazy to, you know, assume that everyone could just transition to distance learning. Right. Did they not have a technical device? They didn't have access to Wi-Fi or Internet. And it's like, are you serious right now? We need to provide families with the technology and also the access to internet that they need. So the one thing that the district did do, they they did jump into, you know, they jumped into a mode like we need to make this happen. They did. I did notice that on the news, it was like a bus that goes around in some communities that are getting right. internet for an hour. How does that work? Maybe people don't necessarily know all the specifics. Right. So it's a Wi-Fi, it's a bus that's um, enabled with Wi-Fi and it drives to different communities during certain hours of the day. So those families who may live in a weekly or apartment complex okay. can have access to the Internet so children can complete their work or at least check in um, with their teachers so mm -hmm. that their attendance is being counted. Because that's something that still needs to happen. Although the school buildings are closed, you still need to check in with your teachers or the school in order for your attendance to um, count. And also the partnership with Cox Communication and other um, internet providers was helpful because families could get Wi-Fi for $9.95 per month. And in some cases they were able to get it for free. But we need these what my hopes are is that 
this next school year that we have access to that at the beginning of the school year. Right. Um, children should have access to a Chromebook or iPad, some type of technology provided by the school and the Wi-Fi access that they need at the beginning of the school year. So those are the things that I saw immediately, that tech, that technology divide and also the food insecurity. Jay, what are your thoughts? Um, I definitely agree 100% with everything that Tamika has stated, but to take it a step further, I think that there is a great opportunity to build relationships and bridges with stakeholders in the community. I think that um, as a small business owner myself, there are so many opportunities for philanthropic work to be done that benefits the students of our schools and our families. And it's almost as if a lot of individuals that are in the decision-making positions have gotten to a point of, of relating to the needs of our students by what the numbers reflect instead of what the realities are. Mm -hmm. And so if they come down into the communities and get back to the grassroots level, the numbers quantify the data, but it doesn't tell the story all the time. And because we are grassroots working with business owners, I mean, the digital divide issue, it, it could have been resolved very swiftly. You know, you have c major companies like Best Buy and all of these other organizations. Um, there's an entire blind institute who refurbishes computers in our city mm -hmm. and Opportunity Village and places like that where there could have been resources provided. Um, but because those relationships are not established between the school district and those vendors um, to meet the need of the community, then they were not a resource that was accessible. And so I think the mindset has to change of the district. A lot of people view the community as being a part of the school district when in fact the school district is a part of the community. And what mm -hmm. happens in the community transcends into our so there's a lot of opportunities with building relationships with stakeholders and, and involvement at that level. I also believe that uh, we could have gotten ahead of the feeding issues and challenges if we would have, uh, and I don't know if you guys are aware, but we suggested a stuff a bus program so that the bus drivers and staff could stay working by oh. loading the school buses, already using logistics that were place uh, based on bus routes and doing drop-off service, kind of like milkman services, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. drop-off services to every home for the food, which would have minimized the contact. Um, it was myself and, and Tamika and several other individuals who, who sent that letter to the district. Um, and even with the, the graduations, they tend to forget that every student isn't graduating out of a home. We have graduates that are graduating on the that live on the street and in weeklies. So having an equitable celebration for graduation, that's why we have the Light It Up event on May 29th that is happening and sponsored by KCEP. So there's a lot of opportunities and, and it starts with the way that we view the school district and who really has the authority, we the people do. Okay, I was wanna make sure I had, didn't have any more questions. Okay, so aside from that, let's go to like endorsements and things like that and how you guys are helping the community that maybe they're not aware of with the type of programs that could be available in, the, in this whole total pandemic thing. So I know there's people probably with daycare, food, um, possibly transportation, um, they don't may not know of resources because maybe they're not on the side of town. And you know, sometimes it's the side of town that people don't pay attention to and they go into your main areas where people have the resources and there's all sorts of other resources that they may not be aware of, or even maybe they, they may be aware of, but don't know how to approach it, don't know what to do. Right, so even with resources, you're. I want to make sure that I'm answering your question. So as far as resources that are available to families during this pandemic? Yes. Okay. Yeah, no worries. So I always um, I always leave people like, please reach out, call 211. 
They have so many different resources um, here in Las Vegas, everything from um, rental assistance, utility assistance, um, the different where the different food pantries are. 211 is an amazing resource um, for all things like that. Also, Three Square, Three Square Food Pantry. I I give big ups and shout outs to Three Square because during the pandemic, <laughs> They have been they have been giving away tons and tons of food throughout this valley um, almost every day. Project 150 has been amazing for those who have teenagers. Um, you, they have access to clothing, bus passes, also food for students as well. And um, with child care, with our Head Start Centers, um, Sunrise Children's Foundation, Ocelero Head Start, although our centers were closed, for those students who were in those um, facilities, we still continued distance learning. We still gave out diapers to families who needed it, diapers and food to those families who needed it. But we also were still able to enroll families until our buildings are open. We still provided those those same high quality services um, that we could. And so even with groups like I'm Young and Empowered, there was a community food pantry that started on Facebook through Battle Boom and Progress, where we delivered food directly to seniors, um, to our aging population, to families who need it. We were boots on the ground in the streets with our homeless even. We were handing out um, masks, hand sanitizers, and food. So, and many of those families tested positive, someone had tested positive for COVID. And so we had to be really safe. We just drop it on the porch, text them and let them know it was there. It was just important to jump in and fill in the gaps during right. this time for those families. So yeah, there's a list of resources on my website as well to help um, children and families in the community. I think now more than ever, I think people are gonna see the value of teachers because education and volunteering is, um, I think it's, it's underrated. I think many of us agree, especially if, if, you, if, you, if you're an involved parent that has children, you know, um, you know, what is it that people can do to support educators and teachers? And I'm sure because you are for family, you're advocates for family, you're both advocates for children, you know, you also have to be advocate for educators. What would you say to people who can support? For the uh, this is Jante. So this is Jante. What I have done is I have created a weekly um, talk, talk time, a talk and chew for educators as well as support staff individuals. As a certified life coach, I've rallied other life coaches to provide them with emotional support and planning support on, you know, what are we going to do next, right? Um, where did we go wrong in providing the support to educators and support staff? How could we have done a better job? Not necessarily in your job, job perspective or your roles and responsibilities, but how you handle them. And then how are, what changes are we going to put in place um, for next school year to make sure that you have that work-life balance and you feel appreciated and you feel supported and that we as a community are supporting you. Also involving parents. Um, I think part of the disconnect is People say come to the board meetings, listen to the board meetings and all of that stuff. A lot of that information that gets conveyed is over people's heads. If you are not active in the district or working in the district, you don't know what half of the stuff is that they're talking about or how it could potentially impact you. So what I have decided to do is to do the tea time with Jay so that I can take um, important topics that are being discussed and decisions that are getting ready to be made, break them down to a level of understanding where I can match the level of my audience and right. their understanding, and then say, what support do you need, right? Mm -hmm. And so I have two separate groups. 
one for education professionals and support staff, and then a separate one for members of the community and staying connected in that manner for sure. Awesome. So with everything that's happening right now, you know, of course, COVID-19 is kind of stressing a lot of people out, really not knowing what direction, um, you know, the where the world is going. How are you guys really surviving um, during this pan pandemic? You know, how is your campaign going right now? <laughs> Jay, you want to take Oh, man. It's got to be it's difficult. It has to be. This, you know what is so it's so difficult. Um, you know, even just making the decision to run for office was one of those where you have to get the involvement and approval from your family because it's gonna, you know, it's gonna be a lot of time taken away and it's gonna be challenging, but to make sure that they were on board and know that it was for the greater good, right? Mm -hmm. And so we get this blessing and, you know, we get their blessing and then it's like, okay, we're running. And then it's like, bam, everything stops. Right. <laughs> Stop down, you know, and, you know, even just campaigning. I said, you know, hashtag campaigning through COVID. It's been challenging um, because I know what it's like to go without. I know what it's like to budget for a certain amount and making sure that your needs of your family is met. And it was like, I I will not ask people for money to support this campaign when I know people need food on their tables and right. you know, it's so many other things. So it has been difficult, but I've been maintaining my presence by doing what I've always done. It's just standing in the gap and helping families and the community that needs, you know? It's the only thing that I know how to do is to, you know, be there to offer support, be there to share the resources that I know of, and be there to support them, to let them know that we are going to make it. We're going to make it through this and we'll make it on the other side of this. So campaigning has been, we had to shift it a little bit, you know? We can't so, my eyebrows so, not done. <laughs> Y'all getting the real me. <laughs> I love it. So typically with the campaign, are you more boots on the ground and then you're visiting different um you know how does your how does that actually work? I kind of want to understand that because now that you're not able to like be boots on the ground and more virtual, tell me a little bit about how it was. Um, define the districts. How does the district break down? You know what I mean? Because yeah. I don't completely understand it all the time. And maybe some people don't. And maybe some people don't even get out and vote because they don't understand and don't want to ask, what is my district? You right. get what I'm saying? So I know um, on our on our websites, we have our district breakdown, like what district we, um, we cover. So my and it's typically like the west side, the historic west side, and certain parts of North Las Vegas. The district is so, I mean, it's broken down in such a, I won't say a weird way, but ballots are in the mail, right? <laughs> right? Ballots are in the mail right now, and you'll be able to look at the ballot and see which district which district you have. The important thing for people to know <laughs> is ballot. that this is an all mail in ballot. Yes, I, I see you, I see you. <laughs> you know, this, yes, this election is going to be by mail. This is something new for us, okay. right? And make sure you sign the outside of your envelope before you send it in. Like <laughs> voter education is going to be so important um, this time around because this is the first time that we're doing an all mail in election for our primaries. So wow. thank you for showing your ballot. Yeah, so I thought that since I have you both on, then maybe for people who don't understand, this is what you should be anticipating, correct? Jay, where's your district? Correct. 
Hey, so my I'm district Jersey. is in District A, so I have all of Henderson. I'm Henderson. And yes, they should be seeing that envelope. You're Henderson, okay. <laughs> District A is in Henderson. That's why I always try to yes. say the city. Um, because correct. people are like, where is that at? <laughs> Jay, what <laughs> So, now, it, so with the ballot coming in the mail, was it before that they would go somewhere and then vote? So now that's transitioned. So what was the typical, because I still, you still haven't ha answered that question. What is your typical campaign strategy and how did, you know, people vote before? Because again, this is new to us, everyone. So we, for Henderson, people were able to go out and vote at the polls as normal. And there is a pocket of Henderson that um, predominantly for school board trustees carry the vote. They had the most vote, the most people who vote. Mm -hmm. um, but there is an oh, entire okay. um, area in Henderson where there, there, there are people who are not voting. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of them don't understand what the role of a trustee is and why they should vote. And so right. a lot of them, because I've asked questions, they just bubble right. a name, right? They, they just pick because they don't understand what the role of a trustee is and why it's important. So um, in this race, I have done a lot more Facebook live and interaction and connecting to people that way. Um, I have also made sure that I was my authentic self. I'm not a politician. My race is loaded with people who have experience in this. Um, I can't do what they do and they can't do what I do. So I, I maintain my authentic self and I connect to the people and I meet them right where they are. And in Henderson, ironically, um, people think of Henderson and they think of wealth. They think of status, they think of financial stability. But the truth of the matter is that there are more people in Henderson that don't fall within that classification and they are the forgotten people. And so I connect to those individuals and I let them know that I care, I am here and I am a voice for you all and you're not forgotten and your needs do matter. So that's been that's been how I've, I've maintained it. Well, I'm glad you said that because I ain't rich and I live in Henderson. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, wow. You brought up a valid point in regards to people uh, not being educated and not understanding how this actually works. So has that been part of your campaign as well in regards to like educating people on what you guys do, why it's important to vote? Um, because I mean, just speaking with us alone, I mean, we have some idea of what you guys do, but we really don't understand what the dynamics is and how to even be do do what you guys are doing. So we would love to kind of hear a little bit about, you know, um, how that actually works and how you can even get into something like this and why it's important. And and just to be a quick add is it's unfortunate, but a lot of us in the black community aren't we don't want to we don't want to get out and vote or don't support one another um, because we feel that we're not heard in the community. Right. And so, um, which is obviously, if you're not getting involved, you're not going to be heard because you're not getting involved. Well, I, I mean, I have to say, I think a lot of it is, again, based on the education piece, right? I, yeah. There's things that, you know, we just don't do, but I think it's because of a fear of not knowing, right? And yeah. what yeah. reaction is going to be if we, you know, if we do this, how is it going to truly impact us? So, um, yeah, I'll let you guys right. go with that. I'm sorry. I know we get all involved like we're running, but. I know. I'm happy that y'all are so passionate about this because <laughs> it's so serious. Like even when I'm talking with my family members or members of the community who say that, oh, I'm not into politics or I'm not really into government. And I'm like, well, they're into you. Like, <laughs> <everything> <laughs> is, <laughs> please know that everything is political. Please right. know that. Please know that the price of gas, please know that the taxes, please know that um, the price of housing, everything, education, funding, everything is political. Even with right. those who um, who have to have government assistance, um, SNAP benefits, mm -hmm. health care, 
it's all tied back to politics because that funding has to come from somewhere. And so I I absolutely do um, go out and encourage, not only encourage, but empower people to know why it's important to vote and what things, um, you know, what things to advocate for and why voting for school board is important and what issues are out there as far as our schools go. Even with the equity and resources is something that's, you know, serious sharing the information because data is always collected. There's always so much data collected, but no one's sharing it in a meaningful way or breaking it down to where people can understand it. And so with me, I've had an opportunity to, I started a um, nonprofit called Rise Up Nevada. So representing improvement in schools and engagement really trying to help parents understand the the data as far as school performance. You know, your child is in a one-star school. This is what it means. Like so many students are below grade level in reading and math. There's chronic absenteeism, you know, and what what does that mean? So there's things, so I try to show them where it's things that the school district has to do, but it's things that we as parents and community members can do to help increase these scores. Chronic absenteeism, you know, that responsibility kind of falls on the parents. We gotta right. get them to school, right? <laughs> right, yeah. We gotta get them there. And, and so that number makes up the star ratings. You know, I just like to share it in a meaningful way and where they can walk away with solutions on what they can do to um, to help change it in that aspect. Even with voter education, like there's been so many different laws that have changed. Right. Um, felons, ex-felons have the right, their voting rights have been restored. Who's telling them that, you know? And I've been able to, through, mm-hmm. thank goodness for social media, right? <laughs> Thank goodness for social media. I've had so many people who have reached out to me to say that I'm voting for the first time because of you, because you let me know, first of all, that I could. But second of all, you know, I know someone who really cares and I want to be able to vote for you. And if that, you know, and if, if one person just tells another person and tells another person, you know, we can we can change we can change all of the things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Jay, what are your thoughts? What do you do? I, how, how do you get back out there and educate? I I come from a place of relatability. Um, I I talk about how I was one of those individuals that was too busy to go stand at a pole at one point in my life who didn't understand, who was like, why can't they just do this on the computer so I could point and click or via text message? You know what I mean? But then I had to start speaking from a parental perspective, right? And so when you have, and I'll take a a scenario because everything that Tamika said is absolutely correct and I agree. And those are issues that we're we're fighting against, but I took something as simple as transportation, right? We have a, a huge disparity in kindergarten attendance and enrollment. Let's take some mm-hmm. like kindergartners, right? So there's something like 12,000 students who are eligible for kindergarten to go to kindergarten, but they are not enrolled as of the oh. numbers that were pulled this year. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you think about it. If I am a mom and my work schedule does not support me being able to take my child to and from school during the times that the the school hours are, right, that's going to serve as barrier number one for my child being able to get to school. Mm -hmm. If I am a single parent and I don't have a support system, or if I am in a foster family who um, has who's fostering nine kids or six kids with four different start times, that's a barrier, you know, and things of that nature. Or the fact that my children want to participate in after school activities or my child is credit deficient and needs to get to night school and all of these different things. The transportation is the issue. So what did I do? I said, look, 
when you vote for people who don't have kids in the school district anymore or who did not suffer being a mm -hmm. single parent or a working parent or a sick parent, then they cannot think about things that impact you because your reality isn't theirs and never has been. Right. right. So they're not going to think about it. So when you, vote, you have to vote for people who can relate to what you are, are either closely to what you're going through, have been through, or who have a mind to be conscious about it so that the decisions that are made can have a win for you. You know right. what I'm saying? Single parents trying to get kids from school and to pop one or football at six at six o'clock when you don't get off till 6 45 understands right. the struggle with transportation right. you know mm -hmm. and so um you know and, and no and there has not been an issue about transportation bought up but I have read the transportation policies and they are antiquated and they need to be revisited and again there is a opportunity to build relationships with um, Uber and different network transportation companies that are child friendly um, so that we can mitigate those issues. Love it. So vote for what's relatable. <laughs> you know, no, you know, that's okay. easy though. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, I don't have, my kids are grown. Um, and let me tell you with all this COVID stuff, if I had to teach my kids and they were young, they'd all not graduate. So, um, Stop it. Stop so it. I didn't have to teach my kids from home. <laughs> I do that with the rose. Well, that's yeah. not I have little ones, and I'm like having to, like, I'm like pulling my hair out. Like, what are we doing here? So, oh, I, so I, I have a question about that. How are people getting the tools to educate, you know, to with their kids being at home? Because I had to hit, okay, no disrespect. You know, I'm not in government, I don't know a lot about politics. But obviously, this was not planned. So none of this was planned and for many, many reasons. So do you see that now that this has happened, it's not to say that something similar can't happen later. You're forced to now think of being involved as a parent mm -hmm. because a lot of us just put it on the educators, the people, you know, and the school system, you know, even, I mean, and, and I've been one of those parents going off on people in the back office. You know, so I, I, I've, I've been there. So now seeing this, I'm like, I feel bad. I'm 25 over, you know, five years ago when my kids were in school, you know what I'm saying? How I really treated some of these, these teachers, even people who just worked in the front office. So, oh. so how do you like, but I'm, I'm being truthful. You know what I mean? Many of us can say it. So. People weren't prepared. How can we now prepare and say, look, anything can happen. We have right. to be involved. You don't have a choice. That's right. And you know, what's that song that say, um, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. Okay. That's right. Needs That's to be right. our motto uh, for the rest of 2020 and beyond, right? Um, you know, in the beginning, there were parents who didn't have the resources that they needed to educate their children, you know, to do distance mm -hmm. learning. But also, there were staff members who were in the same boat. There were educators who did not have access to a computer outside of their school, didn't have access to Wi-Fi or Internet outside of their school. So that is that was something that was like even more eye opening. Mm -hmm. Um, how are we expecting parents to do distance learning when the educators weren't prepared either? So who have children themselves? Who have children themselves? <laughs> Absolutely. And so when they reached out to me, you know, I oh oh goodness, when they reached out to me, I was able to reach out to other community members um, and put together what I call pandemic baskets, pandemic packages sent them out to those teachers who I who had reached out to say that they didn't have. And we filled in the gaps for those educators. Um, also, the Public Education Foundation and Spread the Word Nevada have been really good too. They've been sending items to students' homes as well to supplement learning. And it's so important, they're always looking for volunteers. They have volunteer kits next week to put these packages together 
to send out to homes. So again, if we stay ready, we don't have to get ready. I'm sure that we'll be able to have a stronger plan if we ever need it. Right. Yeah, I, mean, I think this was just a really big eye opener to everyone, you know, uh, especially for um, just the community in general, understanding the importance of the role that teachers play. Right. Yes. And exactly like you said, you know, we, we are all parents where we get in this place where we're like it's all the, the responsibility of the educator. But now we're in a space where it's both of our responsibilities and we both have to be um, accountable. Right. We both have to be accountable and willing to do the work because this is something that no one ever thought would ever happen. And now we have to figure out how we're going to have resources for people that don't have the opportunity to be able to do this at home um, because not everybody has the resources. So. I just love what you guys are doing. It's so great to kind of be in, a, in the, you know, in the presence of like true advocates, people that are driving well, forward. And, and you know, people, I'm just excited. Thank you. Another Thank thing you. Um, I don't think people look at is people look at, and this was myself included, you look at who's in the White House, you look at who's in right. your major state offices, right? But it really starts in your local community because if it's not heard and changes isn't made directly in the smaller communities that expand, then they're not going to hear you out there. Right. So it's really who you're voting in, in your local community, that's going to be the advocate for us who we say smaller people, the people who you think your voice is heard. So a lot of people, you just see who's on TV and that's all you're thinking of is the big signs on the, you know, when you drive down Eastern Avenue or wherever you're driving right. down. You think these are the only people because they're putting so much money into advertising, but you're not knowing even what they're really doing in the community. You just see, oh, okay, you know, John is running for office because you saw a commercial, but you have no idea what John has done all year long. You just see that they put a hundred thousand dollars into the marketing campaign and think that means something, and it doesn't. It means nothing at all. And it starts with you guys. It starts with you guys making the difference. To yeah. allow these other people to, to be impactful. So, yeah, it's great. <laughs> Absolutely. This campaign. Yeah, has we, been we, we definitely <laughs> early in. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, I was saying we early in decided that signage probably um, in the midst of a pandemic was not the best use of our dollars. Right. Yeah. And relatability is very important. So rather than it's a, it's difficult fundraising when you are um, people leaders such as ourselves. You know, we uh, like Tamika said, we don't want to ask people for money. We didn't really know the 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 financial climate really was in people's homes. You couldn't gauge how many people were actually working from home, right? Mm -hmm. And so you're right. The sign doesn't tell the story. Right. And connecting to the people, I right. think that there is a great opportunity for people to come out of their nesting places. That's what I call right. them and right. reconnect. There is a human side of leadership that is required in order to, to reach the level of pinnacle leadership. And I think that's a part of what's missing in the district. They're not connected. Yeah. At right, all. Right. Right. Because I don't know who the, I'll be honest with you, when I drive, I have no idea who the people are, even, but all of a sudden, I'll, I'll tell you this, as soon as people were running for office, all of a sudden I get requests, friend requests, running for judge, and I'm like, I don't even know who you are. And yeah, no disrespect, but we've never had a conversation. We've not that, you know, you have a thousand friends, you don't talk to them all, but you, but what you do is you engage, you're still engaging. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, they're like, they appear on your timeline. And to, and I mean, I don't care for it myself. So it's like, oh, you're running for office. So now you want to have a conversation with me when I know nothing about you. Right. Right. Okay. No, we just have to stay, right. you know, just stay authentic and stay present. You know, we don't have signs, but we do have relationships throughout our communities and our districts. And I know that our hope is that, you know, our constituents and the ones that we know just share, share, share about us, share our pages, let your friends know that we are running and we are the real deal. No, I I just cannot. I cannot see spending thousands and thousands of dollars on signage when 
children are still hungry. Children right. still don't have the resources they need to learn. I'd rather spend money on, you know, filling in those gaps than to have signs up and down the roadways that will be thrown away after this election. Right, 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 right. right yeah. Do you think there's a, a race relation issue here in Nevada? Is there a race? Uh, you know, with race yes. relations. Oh. Community politics, education, even. Oh, oh yeah. For sure. Oh, for sure. <laughs> it, it is. And it's something that totally needs to be addressed and will be addressed, you know, even just the equity and resources at some of our schools that are in lower socioeconomic statuses. Like, we need, it needs to be equitable. We need more equity you know, across the board. And yes, the simple answer is yes. I find and that- it's and not just race relations, there's mm -hmm. also classism. Right. There uh -huh. is a huge what? issue surrounding classism um, that is impacting the race and impacting what is happening in our district. So um, it, it, you have, you have by implicit bias, they say is implicit. You have blatant bias. You have racism, and then you have classism. And these things are plaguing our community. I even reached out to uh, someone in Tamika and I have had conversations, even among the African American community, and the issues of elitism that exist. Ooh, so, wow. you know, if you really want to get into that. That's a whole nother podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I, I, you know, it, it makes perfect sense, but that's kind of how we were conditioned, right? I mean, it's, you yeah. know, especially talking about us kind of feeling a particular way about our own kind and our own people um, and not just yeah. being supported, playing that supportive role. I mean, I feel like if we would just all come together and stand strong. And not compete, together, not compete. There's enough. Yeah. <laughs> Again, we were conditioned that way, and that's going to be a long journey to get us into a place of where we're all uniformed and united. Yes. A hundred years of, you know, conditioning our minds. <laughs> you know, and going back to like the educational, the, educa the educational system and family and children. Um, you know, I think it's still the same because I have grandchildren. I know I look very young. But oh, yeah. Yes, you know, did. this black guy is really <laughs> doing me justice right now. So, but medicate self medicating kids rather than you know, Ooh. really the awareness of mental, mental, I guess, education and um therapy. Because I know when even I have a brother who you know, I said I'm 25, who's younger than me, I remember them wanting to put him on like Ritalin. I remember uh, even growing up in my kids. And so everything was self medicate self, you know, doing some type of medication, giving them some type of substance rather than even really trying to see what is happening within that unit that's causing maybe, I mean, it could be something in, in a, a chemical imbalance, but I'm, no, but that seems the like the first thing. thing people jump on. It's the first thing because they tried to put my child on it. And I'm like, no, yeah. I'm not doing that. This is just who she is. This is how we just need to know how to, you know, teach her. Um, but again, that's, I, we didn't grow up on drugs like that. I just don't understand why everything is a drug. Let's put kids yeah. on <laughs> instead of just yeah. like working through it. I think it's the patience. People don't really have the patience to really sit there and, and do what needs to be done. So that's my take on that. Right. Well, they're not allowed the space. The teachers are not allowed the space to that's educate, true. um, creatively. Right. They have right. been loaded with so many uh, items on a checklist, right? Mm -hmm. That educating creatively becomes secondary to compliance, in my uh, opinion. Yeah. Okay. And 
Um, I speak personally because I have a six year old who was recently diagnosed with ADHD and he's in an elementary school. And, and, you know, I don't know if people know, but the doctor will not even prescribe medication under the age of six for anything like that. So when you start talking about 504 plans and IEP and all these different resources, it's mm -hmm. always, well, what is the parent doing? Well, what are they eating? Well, what are they drinking? Well, what is this? What is that? Mm -hmm. um, the child may be a tactile learner and not be autistic. Right. You know, oh, right. We may need to teach math with blocks for this kid because they have to use the mechanics. But right. the schools are not set up to allow a safe space or a creative space for teachers to facilitate their lessons in that manner and meet mm -hmm. each one of their where they are and they don't have the classroom support. Most right. of the students do not, the teachers don't have teacher's aides or instructional assistance. So it's, it's, it's a gamut of issues. And yes, um, it does result in your child. My child has now been medicated so that his hyperactivity does not impact his ability to learn, even though he's extremely smart and is, you know, off the Richter scale with all of the tests and everything. Mm -hmm. but don't have the capacity to teach him creatively um, in the manner like as if he would have been at a Montessori. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Makes parents, you know, it makes parents think, okay, you know, not having the flexibility or ability to, um, you know, do homeschooling. Because then now you're like, okay, I can't, you know, trust that the school is going to be able to teach in that way. So what is my other option? Homeschool? And then most parents don't have the ability to do that if they don't want to put their kids on drugs. So, right. you know, <laughs> I don't know. It's like a losing battle in a sense. <laughs> It's not a losing battle. You be encouraged because there is there's there are homeopathic remedies. The problem is um, the homeopathic medicine cannot be administered or tr uh, herbs cannot be administered inside of a school without a doctor's note. And a doctor cannot say yes, give this to your child inside of a school if it's herbal and it's not approved by the FDA. So it's a it's it's a it's a mix. You know what I mean? So I did a, the herbal thing for 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 uh, three years and it worked, but it was constant. But when you send your child in, I did the pre-K at right. the um, Heimlet, uh, the um, YMCA with the Nevada Teach Program, mm -hmm. which is an amazing program. If people have four-year-olds that they don't think is ready for a traditional kindergarten classroom, that's an amazing program. But to answer your question, teachers have not been empowered with the creative space to do what they went to school to do. They have been overloaded with items on a checklist and compliance related tasks versus teaching and educating at the level of each child's need. Do you think that could be part of the disconnect between family and education is where you guys come in because there's a disconnect between what we think teachers should be doing and required to do versus what teachers are allowed to do in the system. I, yeah. That I think that, yeah, I think that there is. I think that there is, but that's why it is so important for, you know, parents to come together and advocate for their child and the type of learning that they know that they deserve, you know, and I think that collectively we can impact change. Um, you know, there's some things that, no, we may not be able to um, make changes of, but we'll definitely keep it to their forefront, that they give it at least a second thought. Right. And that's important. I know. I, I feel like teachers may almost be a little bit of afraid to, you know, I mean, I know that they have their, um, uh, can't even think about it, but I feel like they're also afraid to say like, hey, I just really can't do what I need to do to, to really help your child because I have to, uh, you know, abide by these compliances. 
Why is there not an open dialect, dialect there, dialogue there that, you know, teachers can at least give parents some type of understanding because I think we become, you know, that's where we start to attack each other because we're like, this is your job to do this. But then they're like, I'm trying to do my job, but I just can't do my job the way I want to. So why is there not really an open dialogue there? So that's something that I would like to know more about. And I'm having conversations with teachers and upcoming this week. And that can be one of those questions that I put out there. You know, okay. I want to talk to them about how 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 parents should continue the learning at home, especially during the summer. Because, you know, usually there's this summer slide that happens during the summer where kids are not um, in structured learning environments. But mm -hmm. now they would have been out of school for five months. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to talk with teachers to like, what are some tips that you can give us families to continue learning at home and really make it impactful? But you did bring up a very valid point, And I will ask, like, what are those, you know, what are those things or how can we support our educators or, you know, why? Why is it that you don't have those difficult conversations? Just be transparent. Right. I think that that's something that's going to be yeah. important. Yeah. 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 But I really can't. That allows me as a parent to go home and work even harder with my child because right. I now know that you, you know, you can't do as much as you really want to do. So I'm going to be an advocate for you because I'm going to work yeah. hard with my right. child at home so they can come to school and feel like they're being supported and knowing that you have their back. Versus us just, you know, going at each other. <laughs> right. We don't have to go at each other. Like, we just, we got to establish those relationships early on in the school year. And just, like, look, I'm an ally. <laughs> I'm right. a parent. I want what's best for my child. Yeah. You being a happy educator is important. So what are the things that, you know, I could advocate on your behalf? Because many teachers may feel that they may face retaliation. I've right. heard that before as well. You know, there are some educators who have expressed that they're under an administrator or principal that, you know, they know there will be, they know there will be some backlash. So, it's up to us, you know, as families and community members to really start being more intentional with engagement at the school level. You know, what the unions? I mean, isn't that the whole purpose of the unions is to help to support, you know, the educators in, in regards to their needs and what um, they, they should be fighting for? How, do you guys partner with the unions um, to support teachers? So I actually, we, um, so I do not have a relationship with any of the humans. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Tamika. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just saying during this whole endorsement, um, during this whole endorsement phase, you know, we had to do questionnaires with different unions, and I did get the endorsement of the CCEA um, union. And that's, you know, they do have unions that are there to support them. There's there's actually a couple of them. So I want to learn I want to learn more about what we can do, you know, even as trustees to support um, our educators. But also, you know, we don't have a parent union like, oh. like you know what I'm saying? Like we do yeah. have the PTA. We have the PTA. Um, but in some states, they have an actual parent union, like that have rights as well. Yeah. So, wow. Jay, what were your thoughts? What did you say? We can hear you. Um, no, I was saying I, I love unions and and what they stand for. I don't have relationships with many of them. Um, outside of when I was an employee in the district, I was a part of the union, but. Um, the parent union is is a focus, right. and so I stand a hundred percent with formulating a parent union and allowing it to serve as a voice 
um, on behalf of parents. But I also think I, I still just want to I, I think we got to just bring it back down a notch. Right. Mm -hmm. There is nothing like a good old fashioned human to person to person, human interaction conversation. Right. Right. We have become so right. dependent right. on technology to communicate for us and to pass messages that the nonverbal communication that reassures people is missed because it's coming by way of a computer or an app or whatever. Yeah. Right? Right. right. And so my goal yeah. is when um, I become trustee because I'm confident that I have a very good chance. But because you are <laughs> the I new Marshall, trustee, you I are the hope. new Marshall in down. Let's do um, it. I am, I am, I am, let's do it. I would, I would hope that we see more town halls, more community uh, involvement based events. Um, Henderson has a, a last Friday event and the city of uh, the county has first Fridays. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a people level of involvement and interaction so that people can be heard. And, and, and I think that things like teacher appreciation once a month can, can be expanded to teacher appreciation once a week. And it doesn't hurt to stop and go have a continental breakfast and coffee at school where the teachers have made the most progress. Right. Sometimes we always oh, yeah. acknowledge the top performers, but what right. about the ones that made the most progress? Yes. You see what yes. I'm saying? And so, yes. um, I agree 100% with all of the traditional ways, but I think that there are some creative ways that we have to take back the interaction and the, and the compassion that happens between people. Wow. True. That's impressive. True. I'm giving you the. Uh... It has to happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now it has to happen. <laughs> I don't know what happened to that. So I think like people are now afraid of people. So they use the ways yeah. to through other methods. And you can just simply have a conversation. I think mm -hmm. even That's though you true. may not agree or like what the person has to say, it's just listening and having that dialogue so that you can understand where they're coming from. And like you said, picking up in those those um, those cues, right, that we don't wouldn't see over our phone. And that's coming from HR perspective, too, because I'm really okay. big. Let me see. Let me talk to you, but let me see your body language on what you're doing. Yeah. So right. Well, let me tell you, this was such a, a really good really good insightful show because i really really enjoyed it um and i know my our listeners y'all better had enjoyed it too <laughs> so, yes. but so um but you know before we close the show out you know i do want everybody even though all of our listeners you know you can go back to our show page entrepreneurlife.show which will take you to all of the podcast channels we are on so it's always playing 24 7 on our station, um, 365 Live, 702.5 Live. So you can always hear the podcast continually, um, or you can watch the live interview um, in our show page, entrepreneurlife.show, whatever. You know, I forget our page, entrepreneurlife.show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, but, but I want to make sure they hear it from you guys where they can find you because we have listeners that listen on the podcast and some people that watch, you know, and watch the live interview. Um, and then before we go. They, yeah. And then how they can contribute or donate to your, you know, to your campaigns. Got it. Well, again, I'm Tamika Henry. Um, my website is votetamikahenry.com. That's V O T E. T A M E K A H E N R Y dot com. I'm also on Facebook um, under Tamika Henry Envy and Instagram and Twitter, Tamika Henry. So mm -hmm. I'm here, you know, I'm here. I'm looking forward to connecting with you all. My contact information is there. Um, there is a donate link on my website at votetamikahenry.com. But more so than donations, I really need your vote. Like me and Jay need your votes. And oh. so 
Yes, please vote. Please check your mail. Get your ballot. You see District A, District C, vote for Jay, vote for Tamika, and tell your friends, tell your family members, because it's really going to take, you know, those signs on the side of the road, don't vote. <laughs> people do. People do. And people can tell other people. So yeah. that's my ask. If you're looking for a strong representative from our community, you're looking for somebody who wants to fight for the resources that we need in our community. If you're looking for someone who's willing to build relationships and leverage the relationships that I already have to strengthen our school district, please vote Tamika Henry in District C. I am your lady. And I did notice that you have on your website, <laughs> learn about the mail-in ballot for primary election. So she has a link, that. so you can go right there, okay? So, because I'm looking Absolutely. at it, so if any of you guys are listening and you missed anything, just watch the live video and um, the live interview and you will actually see everything on the website so you don't miss anything. Um, and you can go right into the link directly. Thank you so much. And Jay. <laughs> Yes, you can find me at my website, which is www.marshall4trustee.com, and four is spelled out F O R. I am also on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at uh, J Marshall for Trustee, and uh, I think the handle is Marshall with the number four Trustee. So uh, all social media vehicles, but the best way is marshallfortrustee.com on my website. You can donate from the website via PayPal. You can also donate from um, Act Blue. I am on Act Blue. I would prefer the donations through Act Blue. Just find my name, Jante Marshall. I'm running for CCSD trustee uh, in District A, which is Henderson. And um, I will be hosting alongside all of the other amazing candidates, the Light It Up event on May 29th, celebrating a garage door or front door decorating contest and, uh, and tassel turn hat toss and lighting ceremony where we are going to plug in the lights that we decorate our homes with at 730 in honor of all graduates from kinder to college. So those are ways that they can give. To be honest, um, at this point, the uh, general, the um, election, the voting is, is June 9th and, and it's so close. If a person is not able to give, they are still a asset to my campaign. I need as many ambassadors who are willing to share my information, my story, my page, and encourage others to vote by word of mouth. But we don't have signs. So if you can't give, I know I have the $25 campaign. If you can't give, share the story and spread the word about Jay Marshall, the new Marshall in town. I, and I just want to say, I really like your photos down here. Those are like great. I love like the whole community, you know, involvement in your family here. That That's really nice. So anyway, yeah. I just wanted to say that because I always Thank look at that. That's really pretty. Okay. Marshall in town. Woohoo! Okay, so, so to all of our listeners who have been, you know, listening in faithfully to us, we really, really appreciate you that you're always coming back. You're always, um, you know, downloading our, our, our podcast, you know, our analyticals are great. That means what we're saying and the guests that we're bringing on, that means you guys are really listening and these are the people that you want to hear. So be sure to always check in at Entrepreneur Life dot show you can watch listen to all the replays watch all the replays get a hold directly of all of our guests you know if you have questions um and again thanks to everybody for listening on another saturday of entrepreneur life dot show as we're here streaming every saturday i'm rose your host mcdonald bookkeeping services and i'm here with with i don't know this other girl she's my <laughs> And your co-host, co see, I can't even talk. Co-host, Tamar Walker with SWH Art Consulting. Thank you guys so much. Thank, Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. You, guys were Thank amazing. you. you guys have a good Saturday. Thank you. You as well.